Okay, so I'm talking today about applying RSpec best practices. Just a quick show of hands, who uses RSpec? Okay, just about everyone, that's good. Who still, unfortunately or sadly, uses test unit? Sorry for you guys. <laughs> okay, so I think by the show of hands, I think we would all agree tests are important. Uh, I like to think that the Ruby community has mostly got this right. I know a lot of other communities are still struggling with the idea of, well, we need to write code that runs our code to give us a yes or no. Um, but there are a few practices that I think have really come out through unit testing um, over the last, say, 15 years, particularly since JUnit. Um, but when you've got a good test suite, as a developer, when I come onto a project, if I've got a solid test suite that, I've, that has good coverage and is following good principles, I've got confidence to make changes immediately. I can go in there, make a one-line change that might have had something broken, write it a, a spec for that specific case, make my change, get a green, and deploy, and I can be confident. If I don't have that safety net, I'm very scared to make any changes. So I want to just set up some ground rules for this for the talk uh, going forward is that test must support object-oriented principles. So single responsibility, your solid principles, law of Demeter, short methods, those should all be, uh, you should be considering those uh, as you're writing your test and your test should lead you towards building better code. The next thing is that your tests should be able or should be technical documentation for your code. I want to be able to open a spec file for a model or for a class, let's just say, and read through it from top to bottom, and I should have a pretty good understanding of the behavior of this class in production. I don't want to have to go through hundreds of algorithms and uh, levels of abstraction to try and figure out that, oh, active record save actually is going to run an insert into my a Postgres database or MySQL, depending on the adapter and all of that. All I care about is active record.save. So for this example, I'm going to use an example that I think most of us are familiar with, is Conway's Game of Life. If you've done a code retreat, you, you, you would be aware, uh, you'd be familiar with this. But Conway's Game of Life is it's a zero-player game where your outcome is determined by your initial state. It's deterministic. Any, um, any generation in the game is deterministic based on your initial state. So it, it lets us, well, it, it's, it's a really great object-oriented uh, object modeling exercise if you haven't done it. And if you haven't done a code retreat, you should really go and do that as well, just to get your head around this problem. So wouldn't it be great if we all could just write tests like that and get done with our day? Unfortunately, we don't. I mean, we could literally, we would, it'd be great to have a shell script that we could just run, like do work, go have a party, go have some beer and coffee as us programmers do, and get done with our day. But we're not living in that world. So let's go look at RSpec. So RSpec has this really great syntax for describing things. It comes out of the behavior-driven development world. Um, Dan North originally uh, built JBehave, which, uh, which changed the semantics of testing when people were struggling to go from the point of I've got code that I need to r run an assertion on what should I be asserting to think in terms of behavior and that started with it should do x or it should do y. Now RSpec goes along with that syntax and it gives you a describe block. Now I'm specifically in this case describing a Ruby constant. That gives me power later in RSpec to use a subject which I'll demonstrate later. But Ruby is aware of that, and it will create a new instance of the constant of the class. From that level, I then want to, uh, I, I would describe a method on this class. My convention is prefix instance messages with a hash, prefix class methods with a, with a dot. When I'm reading through the spec, I then know if this method is being called in a, 
is called on the class one an instance. So the next step is context. Now contexts are a really good way of finding edge cases. It lets you think in terms of the, the objects that are collaborating on the, the system under test. So let's look at the game. The game would be uh, operating on a world. If, um, so in this case, the simplest rule that we can implement in Conway's game of life is when given a world that's empty, uh, sorry, when given an empty world, it returns an empty world. If I don't have any cells according to the rules of the game of life, I return an empty world. Another best practice that I really follow here is goes against what Dan North's um, original DDD paper suggests of using should and follow what Master Yoda says instead because who doesn't love Yoda? <laughs> do or do not. There is no try. Now, be assertive. It returns an empty world. When I'm running my tests and I get to the documentation output, that's going to literally read game stick method. When I give it an empty world, it's going to return an empty world. If that test is green, I know it works. If it's red, well, something's gone wrong. Okay. So then I, you know, in the, inside the it block, that is your actual unit of execution. That's where you're going to do your assertion. You're going to set up some context and check some state against it. So we'll start with an empty world. That is our collaborating object according to our context. We, go, we have our subject, which is going to be an instance of game. We're going to give it an empty world. And the, we're going to then say, well, second world, when I call empty on it, it must be true. But use, but rspec has got a really nice syntax around this. And if you, don't, if you haven't used it, this so this is where Ruby's expressiveness really comes out as well. Is instead of saying must equal true, you can say second world must be empty. It will then look for a predicate method, or em a method called empty question mark on world, and call that and assert that it is true. Okay, so my, the next thing that I always do with RSpec uh, comes into your settings. The few, just three settings that you should always be running with when you're working with RSpec. First is color your output. Second is profile your tests. And the third is formatted in the documentation. And you can put this into a .rspec file in, your, in the root directory of your project and it will always run RSpec with these arguments. And your output will look something along these lines, assuming that your tests are green. The nice thing about this is you've got really nice, well, really easy to read documentation on your code. And you're not using rubbish tools like Cucumber, strong opinions. <laughs> Who likes Cucumber, seriously? Sorry for you. <laughs> okay, so, and when you follow these rules, I'm, I'm going to just take a little segue here and just show a little project I've been hacking on in the last while. And I've been following a lot of these best practices. There are a couple of things I haven't quite got yet, but when I run Rakespec on this project, and let's hope that it actually works. Okay, I, at the bottom I get my documentation output, uh, my profiled output that shows the 10 slowest examples of my test suite. But then it's really easy to read through the, um, the actual documentation. It's easy to figure out what the code is doing based on the specs without actually ever looking at the code. Okay. So just a change of gears here um, is that we, we are proponents of test-driven development, most of us. Um, and as a developer, I want to be producing the best code that I can. That's, that means I want to use the tools available, like RSpec, to support object-oriented best practices. So Solid and Law of Demeter, I follow just about religiously. 
just a quick one. First person, well, by hand, who can name all five solid principles gets a, t a platform 45 shirt. Anyone? No, I'm shocked. Yeah, can you? All five. No Googling. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Guys, Ruby is an object oriented language. We need to be applying these uh, best practices. You've got one? <laughs> oh, you've got two? <laughs> okay. Sorry, no shirt sense. <laughs> okay. The next best practice in terms of using RSpec, but just test driven development in general, is don't test your framework. Um, we all, we're often using Rails. I wouldn't say we all are, but uh, if you're working with Rails, it's very easy to get into testing. Well, th does this validation fire before I save? Well, trust me, Rails wouldn't have been released if it didn't. I pretty much trust their framework, or their test suite. So I don't want to get involved in testing the internals of Rails specifically. I would rather have an orthogonal layer between my code and, and the framework. So this comes back to single responsibility principles, not mixing concerns. This kind of ties into my next point, is to avoid integration testing where, po where possible. Now, RSpec is great for its describing syntax, but when you're working with a single or with a class, like in our context it was game, those tests can run in a fraction of the time of having to spin up in a, a browser and test your full stack. So favor unit testing where you can. And the other point of test-driven development is that it forces you to be the first consumer of your public API. So write the code that you want, the, the code in the way you want to be able to use it before you write the actual implementation of that code. I'm leaving time for questions and answers. Um, but these are resources that I highly recommend, particularly better specs. Uh, and Mustard I didn't go into now is um, You'll notice in my test I use the, the term must instead of should. Ryan Bates has a, a gem that you can plug in called mustard that it essentially gives you a, the must keyword of a should, which again just comes back to being assertive. Okay. Um, okay, have you got any questions on that? Can I? Yes. Yes. I don't like to say it depends, but it depends. <laughs> um, okay, so realistically, let is going to take a block and then it will memoize the result of that. Uh, I will use let if I've, if I've got shared, uh, a shared collaborator across multiple tests, but I rarely let or allow a let block to be shared across multiple contexts. Four? It behaves like, um, well, it, it gives you some great expressiveness. So it behaves like a list or it um, custom matches and things in the RSpec. Yes. Use them where you, uh, wherever you're doing the same assertion multiple times, perhaps, where you may have. Uh, a polymorphic type instance and you want to test every class uh, in, and you have similar assertions but with different values in there. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just thinking, I'm trying to think of a practical example from my head now, but that, that's kind of where it behaves like. Uh, it comes really, uh, comes really handy. Um, and yes, I, I, I would use that as a best practice.
Uh, zero? Seriously? I haven't had problems with... Okay, um, I confess I've only been doing Ruby since 2011. So I haven't had that much of a problem with it. But um, going from, uh, I think the first RSpec I used was about 201 to the current version 212. No, I haven't done pre-2, but I have had a, I have worked on one code base somewhere on the line that was RSpec 1. Didn't bring it up to date though. So answer, I have lost zero sleep over it. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, that is a testament if you consider that JUnit hasn't bro broken that. And I, um, oh well. <laughs> yes, well. <laughs> you know my views on test units. Yes, Aaron. Yes, I love it. I do love it. I just find that some of the tooling around it is still a bit lacking in. Um, in terms of bringing in things like Factory Go, and it's very easy to just drop a gem in with RSpec where that integration and ease of use isn't quite there with Minitest yet. But I believe it will get there, and I think Minitest is going to take over that space. Anything else? Okay, is that it? Thank you. <laughs>